The European Court of Human Rights, sitting on the 13th of April 2023 in a single judge formation, was asked to examine whether the prohibition of cannabis pursues a legitimate purpose. As Germany and other nations intend to regulate the cannabis market, this is a topic of great interest. To the extent that a regulated cannabis market is better suited to protect public health, the prohibition cannot be necessary in a modern society, and a human rights analysis is needed. Such an analysis looks at the relationship between means and ends, and several international courts have found a legitimate interest in cannabis use. No court has yet confirmed a right to safe access. Even so, the wickedness inflicted on society by alcohol prohibition was nothing compared to the prohibition of drugs, and it is therefore not possible to talk about human rights without allowing for a regulated market. Within few years, most Europeans will live in a country that regulates the cannabis industry, and the European court was tasked to inquire, one, if there is a right to use cannabis, and two, if this right includes access to a safe supply. Both the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly and the Pompidou Group have lamented the court's lack of guidance. Germany, Malta, Holland, Luxembourg, and other liberal nations need rights to be resolved to continue the legalization of cannabis. And as moral panic has been determined to be the engine of drug policy, many people were hopeful that the increased discord between human rights and drug prohibition would be addressed. In prior episodes, Norway's problem with the rule of law were expanded upon. For 15 years, Norway has set aside the rule of law to protect the drug policy from judicial review, and considering the importance of this case, it was expected to be labeled for more expeditious processing as an impact case under the European Court's new category 4 High. The conclusion of the case might not only lead to a change in international legislation, but deals with an emerging human rights issue, and yet the court would not provide a proper hearing. The European court does not explain why, in light of all the material in its possession, that the court cannot find any appearance of a violation of the rights and freedoms set out in the convention. As seen in episode 1, the argument was vetted and supported by professionals. As seen in episode 2, the European court received several books demonstrating the connection between drug policy and the arbitrary persecution of the past. And so how can the court claim that the complaint is manifestly ill-founded? The court may declare inadmissible any application if it is considered to be incompatible with the provisions of the convention, but the court does not provide reasons for protecting the drug law from scrutiny. Instead, just like the Norwegian justice system, the European court takes for granted that the prohibition of cannabis is necessary, without offering any explanation. Thus, the court appears to have given in to moral panic, which is treason. Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights puts a responsibility on the state to show that the drug laws are tailored to serve the public good. The burden of proof rests with the state, and in the balancing of scales, no one should be surprised if the drug dealer is found to be an agent of autonomy, while the policeman is shown to be an agent of tyranny. In times of moral panic, there is no security in obeying the law. Instead, violations of human rights will be frequently ignored, and unless the Norwegian state can defend the use of punishment, the European court should have calibrated the moral code of society towards more wholesome ideals, values, and principles through a recognition that drug prohibition has been a mass movement gone wrong. That was the responsibility of the European court. Through civil disobedience, Norwegian activists have asserted that cannabis prohibition is contrary to basic moral values, and the Constitution limits the legislature's freedom of action. In democracies, the law functions as a guarantee against the abuse of political power, and it does not make sense to attribute an absolute margin of discretion to the state. When panic has been demonstrated, it can in fact be established that the legislature has mismanaged the trust that has been given, and it is the task of the law to guide in principle so that people do not suffer from established prejudices. This is the basis for the rule of law. That is why there is a right to judicial review and a principle of separation of powers, because certain groups have more influence than others, 
and laws may be passed that are not warranted. Such laws can be characterized by double standards or good intentions that are not achieved, and it is the assignment of the courts to protect against political deprioritization and bureaucratic paternalism. Historically, scapegoating has given rise to totalitarian tendencies. Lawlessness occurs when the system of justice fails to protect the right to judicial review, and the court is therefore conscious of its role, an instrument of democracy. The justices must ensure representation in the political process for those who lack a political voice, and in human rights issues, it is not possible to separate law and politics. The more marginalized a grouping, the greater are the chances of error in the political machinery, and it falls to the court to provide an effective remedy. The integrity of law depends on this. While the legislative branch aims to promote ideals of the rule of law, it is the mission of the courts to make sure that it does so. Thus, the question is not if the judiciary is making a mistake by reviewing the political process, as many judges fear, but how effective the law is at ensuring the citizen's freedom. In this context, the treatment of the European Court of Human Rights demonstrates that something is seriously wrong. Compared to other cases, the refusal to engage is stunning, and what is worse, the failure is not an isolated event. In fact, Madam Justice Shembri Orland, the single judge that on the 13th of April 2023 denied judicial review to drug users, is continuing the misconduct of her predecessor, Vincent de Gaetano. In Episode 1, the Norwegian justice system's long history of refusal to intervene on behalf of drug users was discussed. In 2010, the right to judicial review was denied by the Supreme Court, but sitting in a single judge setting, Justice de Gaetano protected the drug policy from scrutiny. Even though the application was supplemented by letters of support from Norwegian politicians and experts on drug policy, this judge decided on the 3rd of April 2012 that, in the light of all the materials in its possession, and in so far as the matters complained of were within its competence, the admissibility criteria set out in Articles 34 and 35 of the Convention had not been met. Even so, there was nothing in these articles to vindicate the decision of the court. Speaking of the argument, it was examined by professors of law, and Justice de Gaetano's own lack of competence is no good reason for dismissing the case. The failure of de Gaetano to provide an independent, impartial, and competent tribunal is demonstrated by the fact that more recent courts have looked at this issue as it refers to the possession and use of cannabis specifically. Tribunals from Colombia, Mexico, and South Africa have recognized autonomy for cannabis use, and the judgments are in line with the argument of Norwegian activists, only eclipsed by their perspective. While other courts have validated the right of drug users to be free from unjust persecution, the Alliance for Rights-Oriented Drug Policies, AROD, claims that this rule should also apply to drug dealers and producers. The argument is controversial because we are living in times of moral panic, but simple. Western constitutional heritage puts principles of equality, proportionality, dignity, and the liberty presumption at the core of our conventions, and the state must show good reasons for denying free will. Like alcohol users, however, most cannabis users are functioning citizens, and as there are recognized autonomy interests involved when it comes to a choice in drugs, society has no business persecuting drug users. This is the understanding that explains the trend towards decriminalization. It is a good thing, but if we recognize that there are legitimate interests involved when it comes to drug consumption, the notion of a legitimate purpose is dispelled, and we must recognize that persecuting drug dealers and producers makes no sense. It makes no sense because, as Lysander Spooner noted, these people are merely accomplices of the user, and it is a rule of law as well as reason that if the principle in any act is not punishable, the accomplice cannot be. Having discarded the idea that drug users must be protected from themselves, there is simply no legal basis for the persecution of drug dealers and producers. Instead, society must awaken to the realization that the drugs themselves are neither good nor bad, but substances that can be used for better or for worse, and that there is the same law of supply and demand involved when it comes to licit and illicit drugs.
Despite the effect of moral panic, some judges have connected the dots. As Justice Kavanaugh of the Supreme Court of Michigan held in 1972, I state the conviction that the government has no constitutional authority to prescribe possession and private use of marijuana. The right to possess and use something, however, has little meaning unless one also has the right to acquire it, and hence prescription of sale cannot be reconciled with a right to possess and use. It may be that some legitimate public interest may be served by the regulation of traffic in marijuana, but a statute which absolutely forbids the sale of marijuana is as offensive to the right of privacy and the pursuit of happiness as a statute which forbids its possession and use. There are also other judges who have covered this topic. In State v. Baker, the Supreme Court of Hawaii held that an assured right of possession would necessarily imply some adequate method to obtain not subject to destruction at the will of the state. And professors of law agree. Discussing Areola, a decision adopted by the Argentine Supreme Court in 2009 which declares the criminalization of drug possession for personal use unconstitutional, Lucas Grossman noted in his work Drugs Under the Constitution, If we believe there is a right to use drugs as part of our autonomy, we cannot prosecute drug provision, which is instrumentally necessary to perform the conduct protected by such right. The fact that drugs can be found all the same is no valid answer for the state, since that is so despite its attempts to prevent it. Moreover, it could not be claimed that the state adequately protects this right if it pushes the user to the illegal market as the only way to access the drug. Thus, reason is replacing moral panic, and the average drug dealer should have less to fear from the European court than the average policeman and legislator. For decades, the legislative has failed to provide safe and reasonable access to a product of high demand, while the police have arrested those who did not comply. Violence has assisted the state in maintaining a monopoly on the sale of drugs, but many people prefer cannabis before alcohol, and this ensures much to do for the criminal justice system. This also includes much unnecessary suffering. For 60 years, drug policy has been driven by people with an extreme ideology where exclusion, demonization, and violence have been established practices. It is becoming increasingly clear that this makes the problem worse, not better, but the European court has sided with tyranny. There is no middle ground. Tyranny and autonomy are opposites in a meaningful universe, and while the drug dealers have offered a product that there are good enough reasons to buy, the justice system has offered coercion and deprivation of liberty. If human rights protect drug use, as more and more international courts claim, do not the police have a greater ethical problem than drug dealers? Do not those who led the way in eradicating the problem have more to answer for? The question touches the core of the drug law, the morality that perpetuates persecution. As the Norwegian Director of Prosecutions has acknowledged, the differential treatment of drug users is paradoxical, which strains the authority of the law, and yet the European court continues the charade. It comes as no surprise that the power of public panic was too much for Justice Vincent de Gaetano. Before rejecting the appeal of drug users, de Gaetano had joined the Maltese Attorney General's office in 1979, where he served as Deputy Attorney General from 1989 to 1994. From this position, he continued as a judge of the superior courts and was appointed chief justice. Coming from a history of putting drug law violators behind bars for more than 30 years, it is no wonder that the argument for human rights proved too much for his discernment. After a career in the prosecution authority, de Gaetano was well versed in interpreting the human rights provisions in the Constitution of Malta on prohibitionist terms, and his hypocrisy is plain. Speaking before audiences, De Gaetano fondly remembers St. Augustine and the idea that if we remove justice, governments are but organized brigandage. Understanding that justice and good governance go hand in hand, he recognizes that for the rule of law to be effective, there must be a genuine predisposition, an attitude, of those in any position of power to go beyond merely paying lip service to Article 6 and its guarantee of a right of access to a court. And yet, when push came to shove, De Gaetano left Europe's most vulnerable population unprotected. Justice de Gaetano retired from the European Court in September 2019, 
and was replaced by Lorraine Shembri Orland. While Degatano had every disposition to protect the drug law from analysis, Madam Justice Shembri Orland should have known better. In 2021, Malta was the first EU country to legalize the possession and cultivation of cannabis. From the perspective of her home country, contesting the merits of prohibition is important, and Madam Justice Shembri Orland should have been morally equipped to take on a controversial case. As she took part from 1991 to 1993 in drafting legislative and constitutional reforms to eliminate gender-based discrimination from the laws of Malta, Shembri Orland is well aware that the European Convention frowns upon any discrimination in the criminal law, and she was also involved in Thorn against Sweden, another case involving cannabis. In Thorn, the court established that the conviction of Mr. Thorn and his fine of approximately 520 euros had entailed an interference with his right to respect for his private life. Mickelson has suffered no less interference with his right to respect for his private life. Relying on Article 8, both applicants have complained about their conviction for manufacturing or possessing narcotics. And so why the different treatment? In Thorn, a chamber of seven judges offered a comprehensive ruling on the court's refusal to grant a right of cannabis users to grow their own medicine. Thorn had good reasons, but because he accepted that the prohibition was necessary to protect society, the court did not find a violation of the convention. A significant difference, therefore, between Thorne and McCallson is that the former accepted the idea of a legitimate purpose. The Swedish state argued that cannabis prohibition was necessary to protect society, and Thorne agreed. On this basis, the European court accepted that prohibition was necessary to combat the flow of illegal drugs. But does it make sense to use the problems that come with a prohibition to justify punishment? Elsewhere in the world, the control of the drug trade by criminal organizations, accompanying social problems, crime for profit and insecurity, are the reason why state leaders want to regulate the drug market. In September 2022, Colombia's president referred to the prohibition on drugs as genocide and told the UN that democracy will die if the state does not take control of the market. And so the assessment of Sweden is, to put it mildly, controversial. With the case of Mikkelsen against Norway, the state was finally challenged on this issue. The potential ramifications of Thorn are minuscule compared to the potential ramifications of Mikkelsen, and so why not offer a comprehensive ruling on the question of a legitimate purpose? Is it manifestly ill-founded to question the necessity of prohibition? Can this not be done? We do not know because another difference between Thorn and Mikkelsen is that the European court launched a press release on its refusal to exempt medical cannabis users from the law. In this text, reasons for the decision are given, and it is significant that the court has not done the same in the case of Mikkelsen against Norway. It appears that the European court wants no attention on the issue, just like the state of Norway. Even so, neither Norway nor the European court can deny a proper hearing without good reasons. Article 6, Section 1 requires the courts to carry out an effective judicial review. When it comes to the manner in which that decision was arrived at, an institutional requirement is that the judgment must be able to examine all the complainant's submissions on their merits, point by point, without declining to examine any of them, and to give clear reasons for rejecting them. On these grounds, both the Norwegian justice system and the European court have failed to present an appearance of independence and a significant difference between Thorne and Mickelson is that the latter poses questions that go to the heart of law. Thorne was allowed to present evidence and to summon witnesses, but in Mickelson's case the treatment does not conform with the guidelines. In situations where the domestic courts were called upon for the first time to determine the legal issue raised, a detailed examination of the applicable law is needed, and this was not done. Instead, Principles of adversariality and equality of arms were breached, exposing a threat to the rule of law. Clearly, the refusal to inquire whether cannabis prohibition fulfills a legitimate purpose cannot be objectively justified when Germany and other nations seek to regulate the cannabis market to protect public health. The application is supported by professors of law, 
even a former justice at the Norwegian Supreme Court, and refusing to try the merits of the prohibition does not conform with the court's duties. The European Court has emphasized that justice must not only be done. To inspire confidence in the legal system, it must also be seen to be done. And the price of protecting an emperor with no clothes becomes apparent when considering Hansen against Norway. In this case, the Norwegian Supreme Court refused to consider an appeal against a decision by the city court, holding that it was clear that the appeal will not succeed. These are the exact same words that the Supreme Court used to protect the drug law from scrutiny, and other similarities are striking. Mickelson went from three days to five hours in court, because the city court did not want to provide judicial review. No witnesses or evidence that supported the allegation of human rights violations were allowed, and the higher court followed up. Despite all arguments for the conviction being refuted, the Supreme Court offered no reason why the appeal would not succeed and the same happened to Hansen. Although the city court had granted three days to hear his case on the merits, Hansen got five hours in the city court, where he was not allowed to examine witnesses or present evidence. Despite having pointed to these errors in his appeal, the high court failed to hear his argument, and the Supreme Court followed up. Procedurally, it is difficult to find more identical cases. Substantively, however, they are worlds apart. And the most profound difference is that Hansen's was a civil case, having to do with the sale of property, while Mickelson's case concerned the right to freedom for millions of people. Considering the greater ramifications, why was Hansen presented a ruling consisting of 29 pages to vindicate his position while Mickelson was rejected with a mere sentence? What accounts for the differential treatment? Could it be that Hansen's was a civil case and that it did not threaten to do away with institutionalized violence? Has the war on drugs become too big to fail? It appears that the hunt for scapegoats must be protected at any cost. The refusal of the European court to act on its duties not only leaves society without guidance, but it ensures that the victims of drug policy must carry the perpetrator's burden for several more years. This is the most concerning aspect of the European court's treatment. At the domestic level, the Norwegian government ignores constitutional commitments, and drug users will continue to be preyed upon by a system that shuns scrutiny. At the international level, the hunt for scapegoats also continues and 700 million people under the European court's jurisdiction have been denied an opportunity to do away with a beast of biblical proportions. This is the true nature of prohibition. In the grip of the drug-free ideal, society has failed to separate right from wrong. But the basics of tyranny are always the same. It involves hypocrisy and double standards that promote persecution, susceptible factions that tell on their friends and neighbors, a police force that kicks in doors and uses violence in search of scapegoats, and rule of law principles that are discounted. This has been the case for a long time. In the pursuit of a drug-free world, parents have reported their children to the police, brothers have become enemies, and families torn apart. The morality that promotes drug prohibition has ravaged society like a plague, but it has been no less devastating for the state. As seen in the state of Norway, a toxic culture has taken hold where budgets, powers, and prestige come before human considerations. To the extent that drugs can be seen as evil, agents of government have been convinced of their moral ground, and it is impossible to measure the damage that has been caused by the cultivation of an enemy image. Forgiveness is nevertheless a key to healing. Drug prohibition continues because of powerful interests but also because of the fear of exposure. It is difficult to face the extent to which Western civilization has been led astray by a perverted morality, and we can all add to the process of reconciliation that integrity which is needed to help society out of a collective psychosis. This is what the drug prohibition really is, and the hunt for scapegoats is a wound that will not heal until the gap between theory and practice is addressed. Time will tell when the European court presents a coherent ruling. Nevertheless, Norwegian activists have opened Pandora's box 
and there will be more applications that contest the validity of the prohibition experiment. The rule of law demands an examination, and the European court has a choice between undoing the damage that has been done or openly promote tyranny. We have seen why. Two Maltese justices have applied flawed legal reasoning to protect the drug law from human rights. This is not acceptable when instructed to rule on the link between public panic and the arbitrary persecution of the past. Not only guarantees of legal certainty, but developments in the rest of the world ensure that the Council of Europe is becoming damaged under a regime that has played its part, and sound legal development depends on considering human rights violations. Since 2010, the European Court has postponed a settlement that must come. Nevertheless, law works itself pure, and as the consciousness of humanity aligns with the spirit of freedom, there will come a time when we no longer accept double standards and hypocrisy as the norm. We will then embrace a system of principled rule, a rule such as defined by reason and the political theory of Western civilization, and we will reap the benefits of the constitutional charter. From that point, utopian societies can arise. A thousand forces are pulling in the same direction, and for the sake of the rule of law, let's hope that the European court does not much longer continue its drift into tyrannical waters.